Well, welcome back to High Tech Heroes. Paul Barron has just told us how his keeping packet switching declassified lowered the probability of nuclear war. Now we can explore some more of his earth-shaking ideas. So, Paul, what can you tell us about Institute for the Future? Well, that one started in 1968. It was Rand at the time. And uh, we're getting interested in some social problems that are facing the country. And the thing that, that concerned us is that the lead time for solution of many of these problems was much, much longer uh, than uh, we, we felt uh, that necessary if we had better long-range planning tools that we can see things a little clearer. Because at that time, uh, planning was a two-year, five-year cycle. We wanted to extend that to 10 or 15 years. And uh, we didn't have the tools. We didn't know what we were going to do. So we set off to create a new not-for-profit institute, which is uh, still in business up the street here, many, oh, many right. years later up in Sand Hill Road. Long story. And uh, the, the, the purpose of the institute was to develop tools for long-range forecasting, mm -hmm. better methodology. Uh, for example, at the time, we got two reports, one saying that, the, uh, that the, uh, there's uh, global warming, we have greenhouse effect, and the Earth's going to get warmer, and the other saying, no, we're moving into the Ice Age, if we look right. at it. So we wondered which of the two reports are right. It's like black body radiation or uh, yeah, and, you know, greenhouse the, effect. The, the, these are, we just didn't have very good tools, and I think we still don't have very good tools, but, but we've come a long way. It is general purpose time. kind of things. I mean, I know yeah. NSF was talking about the uh, oil, or or gasoline shortage, and then when the when the ad actually happened, they started talking about a shortage of water. And now yeah. I'm trying to see that. <laughs> but what but what I think more people the institute really solved much of its need uh, fairly early because we we're saying uh, let's look at a longer time horizon, and uh, it was sort of kooky at the time, but it very quickly became respectable. So the need for the for oh, so this is sort of founded future uh, it, forecasting. It, it was one of the factors. Technology forecasting? The factors, yeah. What, uh, could you give an example of one methodology that... that well, uh, one of the, the uh, well, we didn't develop, but one of the founders, at, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, co-founders of the Institute, uh, Olaf Helmer, Norm Godalki, uh, did it Rand, it's called uh, Delphi, where you have ah. a bunch of experts and you extract information, keep their sources anonymous, then present back the results right. and then ask people to reconsider. So those who have a strong reason for the position maintain it and those that don't. And uh, you can use it for things like a lot of people working on the same IQ test will score about 20 points higher. Mm -hmm. So it does have a, a, a mechanism amplified and it's a very powerful so tool. So Delphi came out of, of Institute Well, no, Delphi came, came out of RAND. Oh, okay. and uh, that the but the people that uh, one of the tools that the institute uh, used quite a bit in its okay. early days. That's great. Um, what kind of long-term issues do you think are going to be a problem now? Any oh, gee, the <laughs> or, or anything that's going to be great in the future? Well, I think the probably it's just the uh, overpopulation of the world. You know, we we just uh, aren't uh, slowing down, and if you take that to its end conclusion. Mm -hmm. Uh, something will have to change. Yeah, I learned about Delphi through the Heinz von Forster kind of people and also about mm -hmm. uh, limits to growth. So, um, so what about uh, spread spectrum? Was it used in anything prior to... Yeah, I think spread spectrum, uh, just reading a, a book, uh, where Paul Green uh, probably did some very early work on that in, for communication, telephone communications between uh, Roosevelt and Churchill in World War uh, mm -hmm. II. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's been used by the military in many applications, and, and uh, what we did with it is use it for a, a very small dish satellite. VSAT stands for a very small aperture satellite, very small dishes, two feet dishes. Very small aperture. I mean, it's very small satellite dishes, so you can okay. put these things on your roof or out a window. And uh, the company was built in that because when we started the company, all the satellites were very low power, mm -hmm. and they took big antennas. So by making, by using the signal processing that you get with spread spectrum, we're able to greatly reduce the size of the antenna. And this antenna. was uh, frequency hopping? Or? No, it was uh, direct sequence. Direct sequence. Direct sequence. Uh -huh. uh, uh, complicated, but uh, it well, worked. I think direct sequence is simpler than, than the frequency, frequency hopping. But uh, anyway, okay. Um, so what exactly is spread spectrum? Can you tell us? In well, uh, that well, imagine two guys who are trying to communicate, uh, and there are a lot of signals on the band, 
and both the receiver and transmitter are able to know where the other guy is. So you move your, move your receiver back and forth very quickly and you find that uh, whatever holes in the band are available, you use. So that permits you to work through uh, interference and the interference could be noise and uh, it allows uh, using uh, uh, less energy than you would uh, with uh, very uh -huh. simple signal. Now, s it seems like uh, by changing the frequency like this all the time, you would generate incredible sidebands. I mean, That's okay. You know, frequency is That's right, because the receiver is moving with you and looking at the exact same sidebands. So, so the two are in sync. Yeah, works out. Do uh, you think you could do that uh, instead of a, a repeating sequence? I mean, they talk about code multiplexing, where mm -hmm. you use a different code for your random mm -hmm. number generator. I think you could do it with a code. This is Mark Rustad's idea. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, could you do it with a code where you pick one and just let it go and it never repeats? Oh, yeah. They do as that for secrecy receiver, systems. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We figured that it would be that, even uh, better than... Yeah, that, that the old uh, one-time crypto systems had a, a random number of tapes. Very hard to synchronize, though. Well, once you synchronize and keep them in sync, oh, it's see. very hard to... Uh, there's a story yeah. about some uh, ship, I think, that uh, got taken because they couldn't synchronize, but, well, it's in the past, and I don't know if it's far enough in the past. So uh, how do you use spread spectrum exactly in Equatorial? Well, it was a way of uh, uh, just allowing us to spread the energy with a two-foot dish or a very small dish transmitting we'd have a number of satellites in the beam and that was a no-no the mm -hmm. fcc says no you can't have a small antenna because it'll spread too many satellites in the beam right so what we did is by spreading the energy the energy that any satellite saw in its passband was so low as to be negligible so this is an uplink a small yeah this small is this is this uplink. is this gave the the uh well you have the, you have a downlink problem and you have an uplink yeah. problem yeah. Now, the uplink problem, you have to be sure you, that, that all these people with little antennas don't point them at other satellites and mess them up. Now, so by spreading the energy, you get away from that problem. You know, in the, gosh, in the early 70s, control data, I was consulting, and I made a calculation that there was a fixed amount of bandwidth and really footprint. The mm -hmm. product of those was fixed on the Earth, especially for geosynchronous orbit. Mm -hmm. And so um, they thought that there were going to be a limited number of satellites, and it was going to be <laughs> terrible, you know, a terrible uh, uh, jockeying to get use of the satellites. Now, it seems to me with spread spectrum, does that change the actual bandwidth calculations? Because you can have footprints overlap now. And yeah, just do code that's multiplexing, right. right. That's right. And you're you're in a domain where you, digital domain where one signal can just be a little stronger than the other, and it works. Well, there's still some limit, but I'm not sure yeah. I know. Um, I'm not sure how to calculate it. <laughs> It's not as easy. Well, we'll have a beer and talk about great, it. Great, great in about a half hour. <laughs> anyway, um, what is packet telephony? Well, uh, once upon a time, people...